Good afternoon, um, everybody. Welcome to this um, Garden Court seminar on retained uh, EU law. Uh, we've got a very busy hour. This is the first of two sessions that we have. Um, uh, the second one is tomorrow, dealing with the practical application of retained EU law. Um, I have a few meeting instructions uh, for you. Um, you've been placed on, on mute um, so that uh, uh, we can deliver the seminar um, without background noise. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A window. Um, there's also a chat function, but that's enabled for comments, queries and or other forms of feedback. So put all your questions in the Q&A uh, window. Um, we're going to circulate the resources um, to the delegates who've registered uh, for today after the webinar. Uh, and just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded. Um, what this means is that the audio and the video of the panelists and anyone who speaks, if they're unmuted, will be recorded. Um, the webinar may be shared with our marketing channels, including our website and social media, um, just to let you know in, um, before you make a contribution. Um, please refer um, to the instructions in the chat window um, if you're experiencing technical difficulties. Um, we, have, we have a huge topic today. Um, retained EU law um, represents a generational shift um, in a public law in the United Kingdom. So we're going to get straight down to it um, and, uh, uh, and begin with an intro um, from Abigail Holt, who's going to explain to us um, why it all matters. And then hopefully today we're going to demystify a little bit of what retained EU law is. We, we really are all in this together for once. We can say that with confidence and, uh, and uh, we look forward to sharing um, uh, uh, our knowledge and for you to share your knowledge uh, with us. Um, our three speakers today, in addition to myself, um, are Abigail Holt um, and uh, Ollie Percy, um, and all of us are members of Garden Court. So I will uh, hand over to Abigail. Thank you. Okay, can everybody, uh, can you hear me? Excellent, thank you. And I, let me just. Okay. Right, um, the, the seminar today is really aimed at two questions. One, what is EU retained law and where do we find it? Um, and of course, um, EU retained law is a brand new species of law conceived by the Brexit idea of taking back control. And it's important to note at the outset, it's not the same as EU law, which obviously continues to uh, evolve without the UK. So um, what is EU, EU retained law? There are various analogies. Um, people talk about a snapshot taken of EU law, which magically becomes transposed into UK law uh, at the end of the uh, transition period, or it's EU as if EU law has been photocopied and rebranded re as UK law and uh, uh, becomes part of our way that law, that way. Um, Thirdly, it's as if the acquis communautaire has been cut and pasted into our law, or, or perhaps the most useful analogy is Narnia. Um, on the uh, 20, uh, sorry, the 31st of December of last year, as uh, 11 o'clock chimed, we stepped through the wardrobe and into, into the frozen landscape of uh, EU retained law. So if the whole point of Brexit is to no longer be under the influence of EU law and take back control, um, what is the point of EU uh, retained law? Well, it's to provide some continuity to avoid the situation where the body of EU law, which has applied for many years in the UK, the acquis communautaire, woven into our legal uh, national system, um, so that it didn't just disappear, leaving a void or a vacuum overnight. So a legal certainty, continue, continuity of the rule of law. Um, but if we're leaving EU and diverging from EU law, why are we retaining it? Well, over time, the UK is going to pick and choose the bits of EU law that it wants to keep whilst being free to diverge and also jettison the bits of EU law that it wants to discard. Um, and as an aside, of course, that divergence will be uh, within the limits of international real politic. Um, just a quick uh, series of comments in relation to um, the dualist, just to remind you of the dualist constitutional arrangements of our 
uh, set up in the UK. Like many, unlike many other uh, countries, including some European jurisdictions, the UK is essentially dualist in nature. And what that means is that if the UK signs a treaty, uh, the, the tre what the treaty aspires to does not alter the laws in the UK and unless and until it is incorporated into our national law by legislation. This is a constitutional requirement. And once we, when we joined the European community in the beginning of 1973, uh, the European Communities Act 1972 voluntarily gave effect to the UK's obligations and duties under the former European community and later the EU. Uh, and so the treaties became part of our uh, national law and allowed um, the EU law to enter into uh, our law. In the case of Bulmer and Bollinger, Lord Denning famously referred to the incoming tide of what is now EU law, observing that it flows into the estuaries and up the rivers. It can't be held back. Parliament has decreed that the treaty is henceforth to be part of our law. It is in equal, sorry, it is equal in force to any statute. So the floods of European law have seeped into our jurisprudence since the beginning of 1973 important reminder therefore from when the UK joined the EU European law had supremacy over UK law where there was a conflict um, and and that of course was in only in the areas where European law um, had a competency and that, that was uh, confirmed in the case of factor tone. So Brexit has started the process of legal filtering of the EU law within our system, the water as it were, that, that crops up in our domestic national law, in the jurisprudential estuaries, rakes, lakes, streams, pipes, bath showers, taps and sinks and so on. Um, and the plan with Brexit is to discard or change the EU origin law so that we are left with pure British law. Um, as inside perhaps related to those allegedly happy British uh, fish that I think one of our politicians mentioned a few weeks ago. Anyway, um, in order to understand EU retained law, you have to understand something of EU legal taxonomy. And this is perhaps a, a particularly tri a tricky bit because um, in order to understand the new status of different elements of EU retained law and, and how it can be discarded or changed, one has to understand the EU legal origins. Um, and there, of course, are different types of EU law in our domestic law, which um, Ollie and Adrian are going to touch upon. The most basics of divisions are preserved legislation and converted uh, legislation. But as I say, that involves understanding the taxonomy of, of EU law. Um, Finally, my final slide at this point, why is it so difficult? Why, if you're feeling perplexed, just remember something of the psychology of learning. This is a brand new topic and it's difficult because EU law anyway is fairly abstract, but EU retained law is a level of abstraction on top of abs abstraction. The structure is difficult to visualize because it's emanating from a jungle of complex legislation, starting with the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 as amended and the Withdrawal Agreement Act. And of course, we, we, learn legal, uh, we learn law by legal problem solving. We don't have a, um, any blueprints at the moment. We're used to legal precedents and there are none. And we've got to get our heads around legal taxonomy. So we're all enjoying different stages of our retained EU law adventure. Um, Sunny Uplands on the way. And just try to stop sharing and hopefully we should be over to Ollie now. Brilliant. Thanks, Abby. I think Amy's going to be sharing my screen, so or her screen with my slides. So I'll just wait for those to come up. Great. So that's who I am. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is going to be the highlight of my presentation probably, or maybe the low light, I'm not sure, but it's my attempt to make e retained EU law fun and memorable and apologies for the really cringe puns, but it builds upon what Abby was saying. Um, what exactly is retained EU, EU law? Well, it's a snapshot, so the camera, um, snap, a snapper in the middle, that freezes in time, so the frozen poster, um, at the end of the implementation period, which was at the end of last year. So technically that's an hour or so out, um, that photo, but hopefully that will drill into your head exactly what we're looking at. It's a snapshot of EU law, taken at the end of 2020, and it's frozen in time until it's modified. So next slide, please. So I wanted to give a bit of a health warning and basically tell you what you should have in front of you when you are navigating retained EU law. And put simply, it's the first part of EUA, as we call it, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Um, major, major health warning on this is that the government website is out of date. The version of EUA on .gov is wrong in material ways. EUA was amended, as Abby mentioned, by the, the 2020 Withdrawal Agreement Act, and there are substantive amendments that need to be looked at. So make sure that you access the up-to-date version of the of EUA 2018 in order to be able to accurately navigate re what retained EU law is. And the key sections that you need to have in front of you are sections two to four, which set out the three core types of EU law, which applying Abbey subdivision, two of them are um, converted and one is preserved. Um, it's also worth thinking about section six retained case law and general principles, which includes uh, domestic case law and European case law. But I'm not going to go into that today. That's a topic of another webinar. I have 15 minutes and I'm not going to even cover what I meant to go through um, if I'm going at this rate. So Adrian is going to be covering section five and schedule one, which set up the, what the status of the retained EU law is. My focus is going to be squarely on sections two to four. Next slide, please, Amy. So section two, um, which has a definition hidden in section one uh, B subsection seven, confusingly, um, is what EU derived domestic legislation is. And I'm going to be talking about that first, and spending most of my time on that, because to me, that was the least counterintuitively retained EU law. Um, then I'm going to be talking about retained direct EU legislation, which is set out in section three EUA. So that's the tool by which it's um, snapshotted or converted. Um, and then rights, etc., will be my final um, attempt to uh, set out the building blocks of what retained EU law are. So next slide, please, Amy. So I appreciate that this is an intimidating wall of text. This is the definition of EU derived domestic legislation. Don't be scared when you first look at it. I'm going to try and break it down in so it's easily digestible. The first thing that you need to be broadly aware of is what it says in Section 2.2 or Paragraph 1a of Schedule 2 of the European Communities Act 1972. And in layman's terms, um, there are nuances to this which I am oversimplifying. It's law that was made for the purpose of adhering to our obligations as being a member of the EU, put in very simple terms. So that law was made to comply with EU law oblig EU obligations. Now, what does enactment mean in this context? Well, this was the thing that really blew my mind was that EU derived legisl domestic legislation could include primary legislation, acts of parliament, 
An enactment can mean primary legislation or secondary legislation. It's all of it. So it's conceivable that the Equality Act is arguably retained EU law on the basis of being EU derived domestic legislation. And I'm going to speak more to worked examples tomorrow. Um, but it's really important to note what I've put in green and the use of green was to sort of demarcate it from um, enactment and make it clear that it was a separate important point. Um, not all of an enactment is necessarily going to be retained EU law. It's so far as it is retained EU law. So let me just explain that in a bit more detail. This is what is set out in subsections B through to D. And let's look at section, subsection B, which is quite extraordinarily broad. So passed or made or operating for a purpose mentioned in section 2.2. Well, what does operating for a purpose mean? Operating for a purpose, in essence, I think, gets rid of a temporal link. So for example, a primary act of parliament, a primary piece of legislation, an act of parliament, could have been passed before an EU law obligation arose. But when that EU law obligation arose and the UK was required to catch up, because it already had that legislation in place, it didn't need to pass new legislation to be compliant. So the previous legislation were, is, could be said to be retained EU law, even if it predates the EU obligation arising, because it's now operating for the purpose of meeting that obligation. And then if you look at subsection D, that is clearly setting out just how broad um, what EU derived domestic legislation could be. Relating otherwise to the EU or EEA, it's hard to think of a more catch-all term than that. So I'll, we'll, we'll be exploring this more tomorrow, but this leaves the door open for quite a big category of primary and secondary legislation to be tr constitute EU derived domestic legislation. So that's category one, and hopefully that wasn't too mind blowing. Um, it suddenly, I, I'm finding it lots to digest. So we're all in the same boat here. Um, second, uh, so second type and next slide, please. Again, I'm hitting you with a wall of text, I'm afraid. And that is because you'll get these slides shared and you can go back and read them and digest them at your leisure. What do you really need to look at in that slide? Well, it's direct legislation. So legislation that is directly applicable, that is enforced, that individuals can enforce without further implementing legislation or has, or as it were, has come through the pipeline of um, the conduits in ECA. So what do these things cover? Um, so EU regulations, EU decisions and EU tertiary legislation. Don't worry if you don't know what those terms mean. You can look them up. Um, but also, I didn't know what an EU tertiary legislation was until very recently. It doesn't really come up in your public law practice very much because it's exceptionally neat. But an EU regulation, put broadly, is, a, is legislation from the EU that binds all member states. EU decision, is something that binds specific individuals. Now, there's a notable omission here from um, the big type, big types of EU um, created legislation is directives. Now, directives are not covered here. That's an exemption. So could you go to the next slide, please, Amy? So it was, this is my way of distilling it down into the key points that you if you don't remember anything else about what retained direct EU legislation is, please remember these points. Again, it's when did it apply? End of the transi transition period, December the 31st, 2020. 
That's the point you're looking at. You only need to be looking at the English language versions. Do not worry if it's not, um, if it's in a different language, the only the English language version comes through. There are many exclusions, there are exempted decisions, and you need to go through them with a fine tooth comb. But importantly, EU directives are not part of direct EU legislation. Now, next slide, please. Ooh, great. Now this is the final category um, and that I'm going to speak to and hopefully it um, makes sense when you consider the previous category. This is a catch-all provision for what I call, or quite a lot of people call, rights etc. Um, mostly because you don't want to read out rights, powers, liabilities, obligations, restrictions etc etc. Um, Again, it's about when did this apply? Again, it was at the end of the transition period, end of the implementation period. The terms are interchangeable. End of 31st of December, 2020. Um, next slide, please. Now, there are some double negatives going on here, but um, which make it quite confusing to read the next bit. But essentially, the right in a directive, my reading of it, is it has to be of a kind um, recognised in domestic or European court case law before the end of uh, the transition period. Now, what does of a kind mean? That is a huge question that I don't think anyone really knows the answer to. So. Is it only directives that have been explicitly, rights and directives that have been explicitly addressed by a court? That doesn't seem right because the most straightforward rights are quite often not litigated. So it would be perverse if a right wasn't preserved or converted rather on the basis that it just no everyone assumed it existed and had replied applied relied on it even without litigating it so final slide please amy so if I, these if you remember anything about rights etc please remember these things it says directly effective rights that aren't saved elsewhere so you've got to read the other uh, mechanisms for saving and converting retained EU law. And you've got to remember what direct effect is. And that might make you feel a bit queasy thinking about undergrad EU law option, but it means it's sufficiently precise and unconditional that it can be directly relied upon as a right. So, and then you've got the other kind question that I mentioned. We don't know what the answer is. It's going to be litigated at some point. Hopefully, it means that the main rights that are set out are converted into domestic law. Now, the final point is watch out for the SIs. And Abby's going to be speaking at, about SIs in a bit. But lots of, and we'll be going through them in detail tomorrow. But lots of these things have already been addressed by SI. Freedom of establishment, for example, has been addressed by statutory instruments. So it's really important to look at the nuts and bolts in the statutory instruments. And the tour that we're going to have tomorrow uh, from Ruth Fox at the Hansen Society about their statutory instrument tracker will hopefully be extremely useful. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Amy. Great, thank you um, very much, Ollie. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and put that on for you. Um, so as Ollie said, um, we have uh, three different sorts of retained EU law that has 
so that has been transposed from directives into acts and statutory instruments that that applies directly largely in the form of eu regulations um, and those rights which derive from sources broadly other than directives um, such as from the treaty itself um, or that have been recognized in the decisions of the court of justice all of those three sources of uh, types, if you like, of a retained EU law sit inside the framework that we have within our domestic rulemaking system. So we have obviously Acts of Parliament and we have various ways of making regulations and orders through making statutory instruments. And that's what we're all really familiar with. And those of us that practice in EU law in various areas, of course, had to draw on EU regulations and on directives, whether or not they've been perfectly or imperfectly transposed into domestic law. And in doing so, we've been used to this particular relationship between UK law and EU law. Um, and we've had some organizing principles from the Court of Justice and some organizing techniques from the European Communities Act 1972 in order to shape um, the relationship between UK law and EU law during the time that the UK was in the, uh, the European Union and during the transition period down to uh, New Year's Eve just gone. So what happens now? What are we going to do? We've got these three forms of retained EU law. Um, we've got our domestic law, which is untouched by EU law. So we've got a whole bundle of laws, of rules, um, and we have to know how we're going to put them all together. Um, and we have to know how we're going to understand the EU law that was frozen um, and becomes part of our retained law, um, EU law, on New Year's Eve, just gone. Um, and we have to know how that uh, is altered and affected by our existing statute book as at the date that the transition period ended, and the new statutes and the new statutory instruments which come into force. And so we have to go through some of the concepts and the Act, um, the European Union Withdrawal Act, gives us the toolkit that we need to try and organise our understanding of this. And so we start off with having to understand the concept of supremacy of EU law. Um, and normally, um, when the UK was in the EU, that mattered because it helped us to organise the relationship between EU laws and national laws, where there was a conflict um, between the two. And the principle established in the case of Costa in 1964 was that EU law um, prevails where there is a conflict um, between the two. And so what happens now um, to the concept of the supremacy of EU law? We still have bits of EU law in our retained EU law. What's that relationship between those bits of retained EU law and the rest of the statute book? And so we understand firstly that the principle of the supremacy of EU law doesn't apply to any new enactment or rule of law made um, from completion day onwards. So it doesn't apply when you're trying to resolve um, the tension between a piece of retained EU law and a new enactment. Um, but in respect um, of uh, enactments or, or laws made before the end of the transition period, the principle of supremacy continues to apply so far as relevant. Um, so that's a question for the courts to determine um, to the interpretation, disapplication or quashing, so quite strong, um, of any enactment or rule of law made before IP completion day, before the end of the transition period. And so the advantage of that principle is it gives us um, some way of understanding the relationship between retained EU law um, and the rest of the statute book as it applied before um, the end of the transition period. Um, it can apply so far as relevant, so not exactly, um, and to questions of interpretation, disapplication and quashing. It also um, doesn't prevent, and here's another issue for the courts to resolve in addition to determining so far as relevant, um, the principle of supremacy um, from applying to um, uh, a, a, a modification um, made after at the end of the transition period um, to a rule of law made before that day, if the application of the principle um, is consistent um, uh, with the intention of the modification. So the court has to decide if there's a modification made to a bit of pre-exit, pre pre-the pre, um, uh, pre, pre the end of the transition period legislation, um, how does it apply um, to, um, how does it apply to um, uh, the, uh, uh, the mod how, how does the principle of supremacy apply in the context of the modification um, uh, made? Because the modification, of course, will come after the end of the transition period. And so we have to look at um, uh, how that works. And the, the techniques that we have um, are uh, that it may, the supremacy may still apply so that the bit of retained EU law trumps the domestic rule if the principle um, uh, it, it, uh, is consistent with the intention of the modification. What that means in practice will be resolved on the facts of an individual case um, by the courts. So it's still relevant to um, 
pre um, end of the transition period um, statute law um, and retained EU law can still trump that, that statute law. Um, and it may be relevant whether a subsequent modifications, um, so long as the application of the principle of supremacy is consistent with the intention of the modification. So there's a bit of heavy lifting done there. And in respect to the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which obviously bound the UK when it was without acting within the scope of EU law, that's not part of our domestic law after the end of the transition period. Um, either. Um, but you have to be careful about this. The Charter of Fundamental Rights is not the only catalogue of human rights in the EU um, system, um, because there are also another source of fundamental rights from the general principles of EU law, um, as recognised in the decisions of the Court of Justice. Um, and so you can see there um, a qualification to that first disapplication um, uh, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, that it doesn't affect retention in domestic law after the end of the transition period. Um, uh, uh, of fundamental rights or principles which exist irrespective of the Charter. Um, and so um, the, uh, the some, sorry, some respect for human rights through um, Article 3 um, of the uh, Treaty on European uh, uh, Union and an article, uh, for example, and if you look at example like a Charter right, like Article 23 of the Charter um, on equality between men and women, um, for example, um, that's something that's also been recognised in the general principles of EU law. Um, and so although the Charter of Fundamental Rights no longer applies, and although Article 23 no longer applies, the principle of equality between men and women continues to apply um, because it's, insofar as we're dealing with uh, uh, the, its application in, in the, in, to retained EU law, because it's in the general principles um, of EU law and in the decisions um, uh, of the Court of Justice and also in um, the Treaty on European Union. And so some rights, the rights etc. bit that Ollie referred to, um, can, um, uh, can come into play there. Equality between men and women can come into play through that portal. Um, so um, there are um, provisions there, um, which mean that the uh, parts of fundamental rights um, which exist through the general principles of EU law will continue to have application, notwithstanding the disapplication of the Charter. There, are then, there is then another point which comes up, which is about challenging retained EU law, and this may be less relevant to the meat and drink of public law practitioners, but I, I mention it in passing just so that you can see that there's no longer a right to challenge um, uh, any EU law after the end of the transition period as to its validity. Um, uh, subject to a caveat, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, previous to that, um, there was there was an ability to trap to, to challenge the validity or, um, or the virus of an EU law, such as a directive or a regulation. Um, uh, a national court couldn't decide that for itself, but would have to make a reference. Um, now that now that we're no longer in the U EU system, um, the uh, uh, the question is, doesn't arise, and you can no longer challenge um, directly the validity of an EU law, but there is limited transitional provision made for challenging EU laws as they apply as retained EU law um, uh, in circumstances where the challenge began before the end of the transition period. And so I've just given you the statutory instrument there, um, the challenges to validity of EU instruments regulations. So if you have a challenge that's already in hand, that will come to bear on you. Another source of law which we have to deal with are the general principles of EU law. What happens to them? They were a source of law under the treaty. Um, they include concepts that we're familiar with from EU law, like legal certainty, legitimate expectation, proportionality, effectiveness, non-retroactivity, um, and respect for fundamental um, rights. Um, no general principle will be a part of our domestic law after the end of the transition period if it wasn't recognized as a general principle by the court um, in a case decided before the end of the transition period, whether or not the principle in question was essential um, to the decision in the case. So that's the first point, um, and that's reiterating what Ollie mentioned at the end of his presentation. After that, there's no right of action um, in um, uh, domestic law um, to uh, say that um, a, a, a particular uh, provision um, is uh, uh, unlawful for being incompatible with a general principle um, of EU law, uh, subject to um, a, a, um, a limited um, uh, transitional period um, of protection um, for three years after the end of the transition period, um, where um, the challenge is to something that happened before the end of the transition period. Um, so in other words, you can use um, the, you can no longer use um, uh, the general principles of EU law to bring a right to bring a cause of action 
um, except with some limited um, uh, transitional protection, um, nor can you use the general principles of EU law to argue um, that um, the uh, that a prince a, a that a rule of law um, should be disapplied or quashed, um, or that any decision should be quashed um, because it is incompatible with the general principles of EU law. So there are two things to bear in mind there. Um, any in any very narrow and very limited circumstances, is a transitional protection to bring a cause of action, um, uh, uh, to bring it to bring an action to say that something's incompatible because it it's inconsistent with the general principles of EU law. So those things like legal certainty, legitimate expectation, as they arise in EU law, um, and secondly, you can't use them to quash. Um, uh, uh, rules or decisions, but you can use the general principles of EU law to interpret um, rules still. So it's not um, it's not the end of the road for them. The fact that you can't quash something doesn't mean that it can't a rule doesn't mean that it can't be interpreted in accordance with the retained general principles of EU law as they existed right at the end of the transition period. Another point to note, of course, is that EU law was, was good for a right, if you like, to public law damages within the scope of EU law for state liability for infringement um, of EU law, um, a principle which um, uh, derived initially from the case of Frankovich, um, where, which involved the uh, um, uh, imperfect um, implementation of a directive by Italy, but the principle was extended um, to cover um, state liability for all infringements of EU law in subsequent cases like um, Brasserie de Pecheur and Factotain. Um, you can't um, uh, bring a right, you can't no longer get, if you like, EU law damages as, 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 a form, as, as public law damages in the UK after the end of the transition period, um, but there is again um, some uh, uh, protection um, for um, uh, bringing damages actions um, for a two year period in relation to matters which arose before the end um, of the of the um, transition period. So there's a limited protection there, but generally EU law damages are gone, except in very with some narrow transitional protection. Um, then in respect of the um, question of how we interpret um, uh, e e EU law, um, the, the questions arise um, uh, in respect, and here we're dealing with a couple of things. Firstly, um, that um, we're looking at um, uh, when we're interpreting um, and applying the principles of supremacy, of the, uh, looking at the charter or the general principles of EU law, um, we're only looking at those things insofar as they form part of our domestic law um, uh, uh, on or after um, at the end of the transition period. Um, so and that, that's the freezing principle. Um, and then uh, and when we go on to look at the role of the Court of Justice in its judgments, um, we're no longer, of course, there are no longer any references to the Court of Justice from national courts, um, that a domestic court or tribunal is no longer um, bound, is not bound by decisions of the court that arise on or after the end of the transition period. Um, so the Court of Justice judgment comes out today, it doesn't bind any domestic court um, or tribunal. Um, however, and this, this is a big uh, a form of words which is going to be picked over by the courts, that um, a court or tribunal can have regard, may have regard to anything done um, uh, before, on or after um, the uh, uh, end of the transition period. Um, uh, uh, but so a domestic court can look at a court judgment, have regard to it um, when it's when it's construing or making a decision or applying um, uh, retained EU law. So it's not binding, but it may be persuasive. And so if we look at that formulation may have regard, um, you can remember that in the Human Rights Act, for example, with the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, um, uh, national courts can take account of decisions of the Court of Human Rights. Here, in respect to the Court of Justice, they may have regard to them. And this question of what may have regard, the scope of that will no doubt fall to be considered um, uh, in um, uh, the uh, courts um, as and when um, the cases come up. So um, the, the question, uh, and then of course, um, decisions um, of the Court of Justice before the end of the transition period, of course, remain part um, of our um, uh, retained EU case law. Um, the Supreme Court itself um, isn't bound by um, retained EU case law. Um, and then under a statutory instrument, 
um, with the snappy title of EU Withdrawal Act 2018 Relevant Court um, Retained Case Law Regulations 2020. Um, I'll give you the SI number for that just in case you haven't committed that to memory as I, as I spoke it. Um, it's 2020 slash 1525. Um, a range of courts including um, uh, the Court of Appeal in England and Wales and equivalent courts in, in the other home nations um, uh, of, that, of, of equivalent seniority um, can also um, uh, are also not bound by retained uh, EU case law. Um, and so, um, and uh, the, uh, and then in deciding whether to depart from retained EU case law, the Supreme Court must apply the same test it would apply in deciding whether to depart from its own case law. So alterations to EU case law in, in, in sort of plain speak um, can happen at the level of the Court of Appeal and above. Um, and so, um, uh, if it should it be the right thing in accordance with the principles that those courts um, apply. And then just briefly on rules of evidence, um, of course, EU law, um, even if you're having regard to it, would be foreign law and a question of fact um, to be proved by witnesses, expert witnesses, now that we're no longer in it, if we didn't have section 15 and schedule five. So excitingly enough, the courts have decided there won't be a range of experts being called to give evidence on what EU law is, um, that the question of the meaning or effect of EU law um, is to be treated as a question of law, which means that uh, solicitor advocates and barristers can argue over it um, and judges can decide without having to trouble themselves with expert witnesses. Um, a relief all round. Um, but it's an important it's an important point because of course remember that you're going to have two brains effectively now. You're going to have one brain which looks at frozen EU law um, as at the end of the transition period and that side of your brain or that brain of yours will be dealing with the law frozen at that point. And of course because the courts can still have regard to uh, EU law after the end of the transition period, although they're not bound by the decisions of the Court of Justice, you'll have a second brain effectively, or, or the other part of your brain, which will be dealing with all the developments in the law, including innovations in case law that relate to fundamental rights and, 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 you know, um, and other general principles of EU law. And, and you'll be able to argue those cases in court um, having regard to the development of EU law, although the court won't be bound by it, and having bound EU law in the retained EU law. And so you're effectively going to be bilingual or speaking dialects of, of, of EU law, the phrase in EU law, which will obviously be points of law on which you are um, uh, able to argue, and also the, court, the bit of EU law that the courts can still have regard to, even though they're not bound by it. And so you're going to need to be very good at that because there's going to be, well, these general principles were frozen on New Year's Eve, just gone, um, and we'll, you're bound by that. These general principles you can have regard to. So when you're looking at the concept of legal certainty or um, legitimate expectation, there'll be something the court's bound by and something that might be persuasive, both under rising under the same concept. So nice and easy, um, of course, it's just, you know, it's like learning a foreign language or it's like learning dialects of a language you already speak. You're going to have to keep track um, of each part. So, um, and remembering, of course, that, that retained EU law could be adapted by regulations made by ministers, as Abby's about to show us. Um, and then finally, just one more point. How does retained EU law fit into the scheme of the Human Rights Act? Um, as we all know, um, uh, primary legislation um, can only be interpreted as whether or not it's compatible with the Human Rights Act, Rights Act or declared incompatible, um, whereas minor legislation and individual decisions could be quashed um, as being incompatible with the Human Rights Act. In a broad brush approach, um, the way it works is that, um, that uh, EU uh, regulations are going to be treated as primary legislation when they form part of retained EU law. So like the Workers Regulation 492 of 2011. Um, and uh, that means that can only, as it, as it forms part of retained um, UK law, you can only uh, interpret it compatibly under Section 3 of the Human Rights Act with human rights provisions or declare it to be incompatible. But anything else um, uh, can be uh, if, if appropriate, can be quashed as incompatible, um, including uh, 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 other forms of legislation that are not regulations um, or um, uh, EU regulations, that is, um, or um, uh, individual decisions under Section 6 um, uh, of the Human Rights Act. With that, I'm going to hand over to Abigail, who's going to tell you all about um, uh, the regulation making power um, that arises under Section 8. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adrian. I'll see if I can do the screen sharing a bit faster this time. Um, uh, right. Not sure that it's worked. Okay, can you see my screen? I'm struggling at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, we can see it. I think you just need to start slideshow. Uh, yep, yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to deal with Section 8 of the European Union Withdrawal uh, Act 2018 and deficiencies. Um, effectively, the take home from this is that the, um, the executive have given themselves massive powers in dealing with deficiencies uh, which arise from withdrawal. So Section 8.1 says that a minister of the Crown may by regulations make such provision as the minister considers appropriate to prevent, remedy or mitigate, A, any failure of retained EU law to operate effectively or any other deficiency in retained EU law arising from the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the EU. So note the wide scope of the, of the language. Um, if, so effectively, um, when looking at this section uh, that deals with deficiencies, you are, and when you're looking at, um, uh, statutory instruments made under uh, the Withdrawal Act, you have to see and ask yourself, have the regulations been made lawfully under the enabling power? Are the new regulations lawfully made within the properly enabled, enabled scope of, the, of Section 8? Um, are the regulations too broad? Um, as I highlight here, there's a wide drafting alert. Um, the uh, under section 8 to A and B, deficiencies in retained EU law are where a minister considers that retained EU law A contains anything which has no practical application in relation to the United Kingdom or any part or, of it, or is otherwise redundant or substantially redundant, or B confers functions on or in relation to EU entities which no longer have functions in at that respect under EU law in relation to the United Kingdom or any part of it. Um, uh, you'll see at section 8D, um, there is provision for or in connection with un other uh, arrangements which um, uh, uh, subsection two are otherwise dependent on the United Kingdom's membership of the EU and which no longer exist or are no longer appropriate. What does that mean? I don't know. These are going to be very fertile grounds, I suspect, for uh, challenges and, and potential litigation. Um, also, uh, considering the issue of deficiencies under Section 8.3, there, um, there is a power where the minister uh, considers that anything in retained EU law, which is of a similar kind to any deficiency which falls within sec subsection 2, or a deficiency in retained EU law of a kind described or provided for in relations, regulations made by a minister of the Crown. I emphasise very, very broad. Um, and the take home in relation to Section 8 is that there are Henry VIII powers here. Uh, ministers are given very wide and elaborate powers to alter EU law by statutory instrument. Um, and as I say, this is going to lead to um, potential, uh, a slew of potential challenges. Quick revision, Henry VIII powers, these allow the government to change an act of parliament or repeal it without going through the parliament a second time. Uh, they take their name from the 1539 statute of uh, proclamations, which essentially allowed uh, King Henry VIII to, to change the law by decree. Um, arguably, arguably, Henry VIII powers make pragmatic sense when there's some small area of tidying up and to stop Parliament getting bogged down in dealing with, uh, with details. I mean, for example, in, in relation to perhaps food labelling changes that, that might occur. Uh, occur. Um, but, and there is a, a process whereby the um, such changes, uh, Henry VIII powers, statutory instruments have to be considered. But the, the, fundam the fundamental issue is that the government can decide that rights based on EU norms are not, are not compatible with the aspirations for Britain post-Brexit and in effect can put into effect without parliamentary debate or scrutiny what could well be fairly major changes. So the use of the power is, um, is expedient and convenient for relatively quick amendments, but it's without uh, parliamentary 
oversight and query whether that is a good thing. So as I say, the executive has, have effectively given themselves huge lawmaking powers by using delegated legislation and Henry VIII powers and effectively by bypassing parliament. Um, and the legal challenges which are likely to arise will revolve around the nitty gritty of whether these powers have been um, exercised lawfully. Finally, I'm just going to say um, a very quick a series of comments about the practicalities and about preparing these cases for um, for, for judges. Um, I didn't do EU law when I was an undergraduate. I did Roman law. It's not proved terribly useful, but there we are. Um, I uh, did a course specifically to, to learn EU law more recently. So um, don't assume that your judge has ever studied EU law. Um, and don't assume, uh, you can assume that your judge may be as perplexed as you are. Judges, however, never admit as not being uh, knowledgeable. So in order to help your judge and, and in order to uh, win your case, meticulous research planning uh, is required and to try and hand it on a plate to, to the judge if possible. And also against the background of being sensitive to the possibility of the lack of uh, Ministry of Justice resources hampering judges grapple with uh, EU retained law. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's what I wanted to say in relation to that. That's great. Thanks very much, Abby. That was really, really um, helpful on, on the uh, use of these powers to make regulations. And in fact, what we're going to be dealing with, um, are, as, as you are aware in your own areas of practice, are a whole slew of statutory instruments um, covering EU exit matters made not just under the 2018 Act, but the 2020 Withdrawal Agreement Act and in our respective areas of law. So, of course, in the field of immigration and social security, the Immigration and Social Security Coordination um, uh, uh, EU Withdrawal Act um, from last year also has regulations made. So when you're looking for these regulations, you're looking not just at the 2018 Act and the powers made there, but in other areas um, as well. And in tomorrow's session, um, we're going to cover, in addition um, to going through the statutory instrument tracker, we're going to be looking at different areas of, of law. So today what we've done is we've had the overarching structure. We've looked at the three different types of EU law. We've looked at the way that they're organized within the domestic legal order um, in and among um, uh, acts of parliament and statutory instruments. And then at the end in Abby's presentation, we've looked at, um, at how uh, the use of Henry VIII powers is, is then further used to modify the statute book. So that's the overarching public law administrative law framework. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to look at different areas of law such as health and safety, such as Equality Act um, matters, such as immigration and social security, um, uh, to show you how it works in practice. And what we'll see is that the picture is confusing, there's not very much we can do about that, that there is, you know, hence we're all here. Um, but, um, but in addition to that, um, that actually you can work your way through it. And in a practical sense, what we're looking to be able to do is as, as practitioners is problem solved. We've got a client, we've got a case, we've got a problem to solve. We've got these bits of law. Um, we've got this incredibly complicated structure. Um, uh, uh, inevitably, you know, no, no one, it could really not have been otherwise. And what you need to do, what we need to know is what sort of advice we can um, give to our clients in a particular area, what sort of letters before claim we need to be writing, what we we're gonna put in there. In addition to all the traditional public law points, administrative law points that we put in there, what are we gonna put in there now? They're gonna do some extra paragraphs in those letters before claim. And then when it gets onto the desk of people who are drafting pleadings, the pleadings will have to reflect inevitably these extra points where there's a conflict between EU law and domestic law in your field of practice. Um, how is it resolved to your client's advantage? It's not just a game, you know, it's got to work out, you know, that's why you'll be taking the points. Um, and then um, why it should favour you, if two interpretations are possible um, on, on resolving that conflict, why the one that favours your client should be preferred. So the nuts and bolts of how that all works is what we're going to look at um, in tomorrow's um, uh, session. And then, of course, it doesn't really end there um, because there'll be endless EU statutory instruments, there'll be endless decisions from the courts over the next few years. Um, for those of us that can remember when the Human Rights Act came into force, there was this great initial flourish of case law um, and then that continued for quite some time. Um, and this is bigger than that in some respects, much bigger because it's changing a much larger section of, of, of the statute book and having a much larger impact. Um, so um, it's gonna be work in progress and all of us will be having to keep up to date with this as we go along. Um, 
the uh, we do have time for one or two questions. Um, if anyone has any um, before two o'clock, um, pop them in the chat and we can answer them. Or you could raise your hand, I suppose, um, if you want to be on the on the record, um, on the recording. Um, but if you don't, or you have a question overnight, you can always um, pop it in the chat and we can deal with it tomorrow, um, which would be useful given the complexity of the subject. Um, or we can have a go off the cuff. So if there are any um, uh, questions, do um, pop them uh, in. Um, uh and if not um we will see you all tomorrow um at two o'clock uh, at one o'clock sorry not two o'clock that would be a disaster at one o'clock um but um the uh and we'll go through areas we'll go through the substantive areas there and you can see how it all fits together and then hopefully we've got the building blocks for applying this in our practice in our representations on behalf of our client in our advice and in our in, in our pleaded work so thank you all very very much indeed for attending today. I, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat that I don't think, uh, I mean, I've seen quite a lot of, of text in, in, in the chat, but um, I'm, if I'm just going to go, in fact, um, yeah, no, I can't see anything. Um, that I, there is one question there, actually, does the ECHR still apply in the UK? Yes, it does. The Convention on Human Rights comes from the Council of Europe system, which wasn't part, isn't part of the European Union, and the European Convention on Human Rights is a treaty which the UK has obviously ratified um, and, which is, and provisions of which have been given effect in domestic law through the schedule um, to the 1998 Human Rights Act. So we do, that's one thing at the moment um, that we don't have to worry about in terms of the changes um, in the law, thankfully. So um, those rights remain um, available. Um, there's another question about the presentations. Um, are they available? Yes, we're going to send them around to everyone who's registered on the course. So the slides will be um, uh, available. Um, and uh, Tomorrow, I see there's a question, an immigration related question um, there. Um, in terms of, I'm going to deal with tomorrow a little bit on how immigration law is affected in terms of retained EU law. So we will pick up on that in the substantive uh, questions tomorrow. Um, I think that's all we, we have at the moment. Thank you all very much for attending. We do look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, keep the faith when it comes to this area. Um, it's very complicated. It's very complicated for all of us. Um, if we didn't have enough on our plates with COVID and plague and, and being you know, imprisoned on this island, uh, we've got all this to deal with as well. So um, hopefully we can all regroup tomorrow and, and continue our, our therapeutic work in coming to terms with retained EU law. See you all then. Thanks very much. <laughs>